All right. Mm. Okay, we left off in Isaiah chapter 27. So if you would be turning in your Bibles there. Uh, Isaiah chapter 27. And of course, this comes at the end of this uh, discussion of this oracle against the world, this uh, against the world city, really, where God overthrows the world. And you know, we, we see now in chapter 27 that uh, we're going to focus more on God's power to act on Israel's behalf. The first verse of the chapter talked about the Lord punishing Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, with his fierce, great, and mighty sword, even Leviathan, the twisted serpent, and he will kill the dragon who lives in the sea. Now, in some ways, that definitely goes with what comes before uh, in describing the punishment on the inhabitants of the earth and the punishment of the great sea monster. Uh, but it also links to what comes after with the phrase, in that day. It's in that day, verse 1. And in verse 2, it says, in that day, a vineyard of wine. Sing of it. I, the Lord, am its keeper. I water it every moment so that no one will damage it. I guard it night and day. I have no wrath. Should someone give me briars and thorns in battle, then I would step on them. I would burn them completely. Or let him rely on my protection. Let him make peace with me. Let him make peace with me. In the days to come, Jacob will take root. Israel will blossom and sprout, and they will fill the whole world with fruit. Like the striking of him who has struck them. Has he struck them? Or like the slaughter of his slain. Have they been slain? You contended with them by banishing them, by driving them away. With his fierce wind he has expelled them on the day of the east wind. Therefore, through this Jacob's iniquity will be forgiven, and this will be the full price of the pardoning of his sin. When he makes all the altar stones like pulverized chalk stones, when Asherim and incense altars will not stand. For the fortified city is isolated, a homestead forlorn and forsaken like the desert. There the calf will graze, and there it will lie down and feed on its branches. When its limbs are dry, they are broken off. Women come and make a fire with them, for they are not a people of discernment. Therefore their master will not have compassion on them, and their creator will not be gracious to them. In that day, the Lord will start His threshing from the flowing stream of the Euphrates to the brook of Egypt. You will be gathered up one by one, O sons of Israel. It will come about also in that day that a great trumpet will be blown, and those who were perishing in the land of Assyria and who were scattered in the land of Egypt will come and worship the Lord in the holy mountain at Jerusalem. Alright, so... Some of, some of that uh, might seem a little disconnected. We're going to talk about this as we go on. First of all, the verses 2 through 6, the, the song about the vineyard, does that remind us of anything else that we've seen before in Isaiah? Uh, specifically where in 24? Well, I just, uh, I remember 24 verse 7. The oh. The mourn, the vine decays, all the merry hearted and here we have the, the exact opposite happening. Instead of the, the new wine morning, we have the new wine, the, the wine singing, or sing of the new wine. Huh? Not the answer I had, but I can't believe I missed that. <laughs> But no, that's a good point to bring out. Uh, you know, verse 7, yes, that there's definitely a reversal of the new wine morning and the vine decaying. Uh, Got to make a note of that. Okay, but uh, no, that, that, that's good. But was there ever another place in Isaiah where he talked about a vineyard? Chapter 5. Back in chapter 5, right. That is what I was thinking of. Uh, the vineyard song, you know, if you remember all the way back in chapter 5 and verses 1 through 7, you know, God talks about Israel in terms of a vineyard. But he doesn't come out and say it right away. He describes how he, ha he has this vineyard that he digs, he removes the stones, he sets up a tower, he sets up a wine vat, indicating that he's expecting a bountiful harvest, and he's planning to live on site during the harvest, and he expects it to produce good grapes, and what happens? Well, it only produces worthless grapes. The vine does not produce what he needs it to. And so he asked Israel, well, if you were in this situation, what would you do? Well, you know, any, what any reasonable farmer would do after you, what, what more is there to do? Dig it up, you know, knock everything over, tear down the tower, and just reduce the vineyard and let it return to its wild state. And, of course, the point of that is that Israel is God's vineyard, and Israel is the one that's been unfruitful, and God's basically saying, you know, what more is there for me to do for you? 
Uh, now here in chapter 27, uh, that, that same judgment is also in chapter 24 and verse 7, but here in chapter 27 we have this picture of this vineyard of wine that will blossom and sprout and be full of fruit. So it is a reversal of that image as well. And this vineyard song. And no one, it says, will be able to damage the vineyard. The word for damage is actually the same word that is translated punish in verse 21 of chapter 26 and in verse 1 of chapter 27. Uh, so there's kind of an interesting little connection there. Um, and uh, briars and thorns in verse 4 are mentioned. You know, God suggests that, you know, somebody tries to introduce briars and thorns into this vineyard, I'm going to trample them. It's the opposite of chapter 5, whenever the briars and thorns are what the vineyard was reduced to. Mark. This reminds me of the language back in chapter 1 where he mentions the shelter in the midst of the vineyard. And he, he kind of, I can't remember the exact language, but if he's going, if he had not left a few, a remnant, so to speak, that it would be desolate. But he, uh, yeah. Uh, chapter 1 and verse 8, the daughter of Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a watchman's hut in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. Uh, the image there is a, a little different, but I mean, well, the idea is that, you know, Israel is going to be reduced to these, basically these lean-tos, these, well, whenever, uh, whenever in the farming ag agrarian world, they would build these makeshift shacks in the field whenever they were harvesting, and they would give them a chance to, you know, have some place to rest on site and have a shade for themselves while they were working throughout the day. And God's saying, basically, that's all you're going to have left. You're not going to have your permanent dwelling places. You're not going to have your houses. You're just going to have that, you know, that worthless shelter in the vineyard, the shack. He says, and that's what the remnant will be like. Well, in verse 9, he says, unless the Lord of hosts had left us a few survivors, we would be like Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of a similar thing to hear God in uh, chapter 27, it appears, is, uh, is leaving a... A remnant here. Um, <laughs> he's he's going to water the vineyard, take care of it here in verses two and, and three, and he's going to guard it. And uh, then in verse uh, four, should someone give me briars and thorns in battle, so the unrighteous I'm going to take care of, but I am going to take care of the righteous. Kind of that idea. Okay. Is that? Well, yeah, I mean, God, God is, de is, is taking care of His vineyard. He's acting on behalf of His people. And, you know, in the greater context of this, it's still this, you know, this eternal struggle between the world and their way of doing things, the world city and the Lord's city, which in this case is depicted not as a city at all, but as a vineyard. Um, Jesus is kind of making the same contrast in the Gospel of John. You know, on the one hand, He says, I am the true vine, and you are the branches. But immediately after that, he starts talking about what the world is going to do and how the world is going to respond to them. The world, he says, is going to hate you because they hated me. And that's in John chapter 15. Uh, so there, there's this kind of this dichotomy here between two, two classes of people. Uh, and, you know, you have this, this idea of blossoming and fertility. He described in verse 6 how Jacob will take root, Israel will blossom and sprout, and they will fill the whole world with fruit. But when does that happen? Does that happen in literal ethnic Israel? You know, ultimately that promise is realized through the Israel of God. It's realized through Jesus Christ who comes and fulfills the role of the vine or the vineyard better than Israel ever did. Uh, now this image of Israel blossoming kind of reappears later on in Isaiah 35. And uh, again in Isaiah 37 in verse 31, whenever... Uh, Isaiah is making a prophecy to Hezekiah. He makes a statement about what's going to happen with Sennacherib. He said, and the statement he makes in verses 30 and 31, this will be the sign for you. You will eat this year what grows of itself, and the second year what springs from the same, and in the third year sow, reap, plant vineyards, and eat their fruit. The surviving remnant of the house of Judah will again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem will go forth a remnant, and out of Mount Zion survivors. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. There's this picture, if you will, of God protecting His people Israel from the onslaught of nations like Assyria. You know, He allows a remnant to survive, a people that are devoted to Him. And ultimately, that remnant is realized through Jesus Christ and His people as well. Um, now, any comments or questions up to verse 6? Verse 
or 7. Uh, we have this kind of this image of cleansing and destruction. In verse 7, it asks, like the striking of him who has struck them. Has he struck them? Or like the slaughter of his slain. Have they been slain? You know, I'm almost a little tongue twister there. What's the point of that question? Okay, well, yeah, it's a rhetorical question. All right. But what's the gist of the question? What, what's, what's the point of the question? <laughs> well, what is it saying, basically? Nobody's even going to try to read it back at me. <laughs> no. Is he indicating here that God has not uh, exacted his vengeance upon these people yet? Uh, mm -hmm. Has he struck them? Have they been slain? Yeah, I, I guess the, uh, the, the gist of the question is that has God punished Israel to the same extent that he's punished her oppressors? In other words, yeah. you know, is their doom going to be permanent? Now Assyria, Assyria's gone. You know, they're destroyed completely. The ones who struck Israel, God struck them and they're gone. Now is that what the striking of Israel's like? You know, Assyria, who was slaying so many people in Israel, you know, well, their slaughter was permanent. They're gone. Is that how Israel will be slain? Is Israel's doom going to be permanent? How do we answer that question? A rhetorical question. What would the answer I mean, you still gotta know what the answer to a rhetorical question is. <laughs> Yeah, he left a room, and that's the point. You know, it's, it's just, you know, the answer is no. Uh, now he does go on to talk about the the what God has done to Israel and how He has struck them. Were you going to say something, Seth? Uh, where is Assyria? Hmm? Where Where do you see Assyria? Where do I see Assyria? Well, Assyria is the one that God used to strike Israel. That's kind of been thematic throughout. Assyria is not mentioned by name here. You know, and really, I'm kind of putting Assyria out there as a for instance. You could stick Babylon in that blank as well, or you know, any other nation that ever oppresses Israel. Uh, you know, but um, I mean, I stick Assyria in there because that's the immediate context Isaiah writes in. You know, I mean, Assyria is referred to in chapter 10, for instance, as the rod of his anger, chapter 10 and verse 5. Um, but in verse 8, we talk about what God actually has done with Israel. You contended with them by banishing them, by driving them away. With his fierce wind, he's expelled them on the day of the east wind. That doesn't sound very pleasant. Uh, driving them away. An east wind, a destructive force. Verse 9, therefore through this, Jacob's iniquity will be forgiven. And this will be the full price of the pardoning of his sin when he makes all the altar stones like pulverized chalk stones. When Asherim and incense altars will not stand. There's a certain forgiveness that takes place which allows the remnant to persist. But what's the price of forgiveness according to this text? Verse 9. Hmm. Well, he's going to uh, make their altar stones like pulverized chalk stones. And, uh, the Asherim and, and incense altars will not stand. So he's going to take take their uh, false worship away from them. Yeah, he's going to take away the idols. The idols will completely vanish. The things, the gods of wood and gold and silver and stone, they're going to be taken away. And it's like the realization, it is a realization of what Isaiah said in Isaiah 17. Uh, in verses 7 through 8, that in that day man will have regard for his maker and his eyes will look to the Holy One of Israel. He will not have regard for the altars, the work of his hands, nor will he look to that which his fingers have made, even the Asherim and incense stands. You'll see a lot of the same kind of language is there. Um, you know, instead of trusting in the things that you made, you trust in the one that made you. Kind of makes more sense. But uh, that, that, that's, that's basically the idea that's being put forth here. Um, and in verses 10 through 11, the fortified city is isolated uh, in a homestead forlorn and forsaken like the desert. There the calf will graze, it will lie down and feed on its branches. Its limbs are dry, they're broken off. Women come and make a fire with them, for they're not a people of discernment. Therefore the Maker will not have compassion on them, and their Creator will not be gracious to them. Well, well wait a second, what about this fortified city here? What is the city that we're looking at? The world city? Ah, you know, well, 
the people will not receive... Now, here's what's kind of interesting about this. You know, does he come out and say what city it is? Well, he hasn't been saying what city it is throughout chapters 24, 25, 26, 27. He's just been talking in those terms. Uh, now, could this city be a reference to Israel? I think it has reference to any place that they feel that they are secure in without uh, without obedience to God. Ah, okay, yeah, and that, so, yeah, Jerusalem could be could be it. Jerusalem could be it. You know, and oh, no. he, here's what's kind of interesting about this is there isn't really a kind of a shift in this. You know, on the one hand, you know, Jacob's going to be forgiven and the city is destroyed, and you know, well, the only the only group of people he seems to be concerned with in this context is. Um, you know, the, the nation of Israel. So it, it, it is a little ambiguous here on purpose, I think. Because it, it kind of gets you to think about this. You know, the God's people is not just a, you know, a specific ethnic group. It's not a specific group of descendants of Abraham. God's people is more than that. It is that remnant of people that trust in the Lord. Uh, you'll find a similar thing going on in the book of Zephaniah. In Zephaniah chapter 3, Zephaniah starts going after this city that's going to be judged by God. And all the times he talks about the city before that are clearly references to you know, Assyria, Nineveh, you know, other Gentile cities. But all the references to the city that come after that are all references to, well, Jerusalem. So which one's Zephaniah pronouncing judgment on? Well, yes, the answer to that. All of the above. You know, the inhabitants of Jerusalem at this time ought to reflect on themselves. Are they the city of God or are they a city of the world? And we ought, likewise, to reflect. You know, anytime we're part of any community of people, we ought to ask ourselves, are we a city of God, a community of God's people, or are we a community of this world? Well, you know, that has a lot to do with what's going on in here and inside our hearts and whether or not we're devoted to the Lord. Uh, so there, there's just some things to contemplate and think about. Any questions down through verse 11? Comments? Anything? Verses 12 through 13, we have the trumpet sound. Most important instrument ever designed, the trumpet. Uh, the, uh, the, in the, I, am, I am completely impartial in making that judgment, as most of you know. Uh, but in, <laughs> in that day, the Lord will start His threshing from the flowing stream of the Euphrates to the brook of Egypt. You will be gathered up one by one, O sons of Israel, and in that day... A great trumpet will be blown, and those who are perishing in the land of Assyria and who are scattered in the land of Egypt will come and worship the Lord in the holy mountain of Jerusalem. Now, what is, a, what is the purpose of the great trumpet here? To call all of God's people to come back. Uh, now, trumpets are used for a couple different purposes in the Bible. They're used to announce battle, one. Um, you might think of Jericho, for instance. But trumpets were also used to summon people to the worship assembly. And that was, in fact, their main purpose they were designed for in Numbers chapter 10. Uh, and in this instance, who comes together to worship? The scattered, but what is, who does Isaiah reference? Does he talk about anybody specific? Perishing in Assyria. <gasps> Assyria? And they were scattered in Egypt. The land of Egypt? Okay, alright. Now this could be just... Some, now it could be talking about Israelites that are scattered in Egypt and Assyria. Or it could be a reiteration of what Isaiah has already said in chapter 19. Where he said that there's going to be a highway between Egypt and Assyria. These two extremities, these two world powers. They're going to come together and worship at the Holy Mountain. They're going to worship the Holy One of Israel. And they come and they worship on this mountain. It's that gathering of the nations that Isaiah has been talking about since chapter 2. Which really kind of, you think about it, you know, on the one hand you got Israel being told that God's going to judge the city and it's kind of left ambiguous to make you think, you know, is ethnic Jerusalem going to escape this? And on the other hand Isaiah says that there's going to be people from Egypt and Assyria that are coming as well. And they're going to, you know, possibly Gentiles might be involved in this thing. You know, it says something about what the people of God really is. Um, now, there's also... Uh, when is this fulfilled? Let's ask that. <laughs> when does this great trumpet sound? <laughs> uh, well, there's a sense in which it's fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. And God makes a plan to gather the nations and... You know, he pours out his spirit on them, and they, you know, they're worshiping together in Jerusalem. Is that the only time it's fulfilled?
the time is coming and now is. There's kind of this tension between the already and the not yet. Is there a sense in which we're still waiting for this to be fulfilled? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. And, and also when the remnant returned to you, the scattered. Okay, yeah, you might think of, okay, in Israel's history, the restoration, uh, you know, people come from, you know, return from captivity, good. You know, and, of course, you know, then there's the final trumpet, if you will. You know, Paul makes reference to an event called the last trumpet in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 52. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 16, the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout and with the sound of a trumpet. Uh, there's that idea that there's going to be a gathering of nations at that time before the throne of God and you know, there, there will be a worship at that time, presumably, as well. Mark? I, I was kind of thinking Did, did you draw any parallel to what uh, the Hebrew writer says in the 12th chapter about you have not come to a, a mountain that can be touched uh, into a blazing uh, 1218 in particular? Mm -hmm. where it says that you have not come to a mountain that can be touched into a blazing fire into darkness and gloom and whirlwind. And I wonder if, if uh, he is uh, drawing on Isaiah's statement about this holy mountain to which people are going to come. The Hebrew author seems to be drawing on a lot of things there. Um, I mean, uh, there's obviously the burning bush in there. And, and Sinai. And, Sinai yeah. and, and so well, forth. <laughs> I just wondered if uh, maybe he isn't drawing a little bit on, on what Isaiah says here. I, I think there's something to that. And, you know, it's... Um, we, I think we may have looked at Hebrews 12, actually, back when we were talking about Isaiah 2 and the gathering at the Holy Mountain. You know, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched into a blazing fire, into darkness and gloom and whirlwind, and to the blast of a trumpet, and the sound of words which sound was such that no, those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. For they could not even bear the command, if even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. So terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. But you haven't come to that. What have you come to? Verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Uh, now, interestingly, he says you have not come to the blast of a trumpet in this passage, which, again, you probably shouldn't press the details too hard on this instance, you know, because, I mean, the point is he's trying to paint a picture of Sinai and saying that image, that fearfulness, that distance that God had from his people at Sinai, that's not what you've come to. What you have come to is the heavenly Jerusalem, the myriads of angels, the spirits of the righteous made perfect, you know, this closer communion with Christ and with God. Um, you know, that doesn't preclude the existence of a trumpet in that scene. And, you know, to fixate on a little detail like that would probably miss the point anyway. Um, but, anyhow, those are just some, some of the ideas that are in this text in Isaiah 27. Uh, any thoughts or comments up to this point? Chapter 28, and, you know, at this point we're going to kind of shift gears a little bit. We're, uh, chapter, and here's the general outline of the book, just to kind of remind ourselves where we're at. Um, you know, we just finished the B section, which is God's oracles against the Gentile nations. Now, the C section, trust God and not the nations, kind of follows logically on the heels of that. You know, since God has shown that the God of Israel is also the God of the nations, Israel is now presented with a choice. They must choose whether they're going to trust God to solve their problem, or whether they're going to trust some other nation over here that they might make an alliance with to solve their problems. So chapters 28 through 35, uh, that's kind of where we're shifting to at this point. Um, now these chapters break into this, these parts. Uh, first of all, chapters 28 and 29 are kind of focused more on the general spiritual principle. And the real problem that Israel has is their leadership is bad. Uh, they're making all the wrong decisions. They're looking in all the wrong places. And so Isaiah spends 28 and 29 not really talking about any specific historical issue, but just saying, you guys, you, you've got so many, you've got a spiritually bankrupt leadership is what you have. And then chapters 30 and 31, from 30 onward, we start talking, what are we going to do about it? Well, one solution is to trust Egypt. Well, that doesn't seem like a solution to the problem listed, and that's probably because Israel isn't identifying the problem correctly. You had gone up to any Israelite in those days, in that day and age, and you'd asked them, what is the biggest problem this nation is facing? You know what they probably would have told you? We got the Assyrians on our doorstep. 
And Isaiah says, no, you got it all wrong. The biggest problem this nation's facing is that you have forsaken the Lord. You have missed the point of our existence altogether. Mark. Can we make a parallel to that, to that to today? I'm getting it there. <laughs> I'm getting there, but yeah, go ahead. You know. Okay, I may jump ahead of you. I may get on something a little different than you thought. But I've heard brethren say that our biggest problem in this country today is we're not following our Constitution. That ain't the biggest problem we got. No, it ain't. Mm. That ain't even close to the biggest problem we got. That's a minor issue. Because that Constitution was written by men. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And if we take Ayn Rand's objectivism approach to the Constitution and leave God out of the Constitution and say that you can't legislate morality, you can't legislate things that are righteous and unrighteous, then we got a, we got a much bigger problem. We might as well throw the Constitution out the window. It isn't going to do us any good. Okay. It's, it's got to be centered around God. All right. Well, I'll have some more things to say about you know, modern day applications in a minute. But you, know, you look at this, their false solution is what? Trusting Egypt. And, you know, it's, you know, they want to make an alliance with Egypt because Egypt's the other big bully on the block who can help them out, right? You know, but Egypt's not the right answer. The true solution to bad leadership is to have good leadership, and the only leadership worth having is God himself. You know, which is why chapters 32 and 33 are focused on this idea of God as king. And, you know, Isaiah 32 set, starts out by saying, you know, Behold, a king will reign righteously. Well, who's that king going to be? Well, Isaiah doesn't tell you until you get to the end of chapter 33 that the Lord is our king, the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, He will save us, 33-22. Uh, now, that's where Isaiah kind of gets to the end of that. You know, it's, uh, and he, you know, he's, he's talking about this king, kind of trying to get them excited. He says, by the way, the Lord is the king that you should be having. And this is the problem. Isn't this the problem Israel's always had? You know, they come and say, give us a king to Samuel. It wasn't, the problem wasn't that you know, they were rejecting Samuel. The problem was that they were rejecting God from being king over them. When the Bible says that Israel had no king and that everyone did what was right in his own eyes, that was not a good thing. Not at all. Deuteronomy forbid them from doing what was right in their own eyes. And you know, Israel having a king, well, a human king wasn't going to solve the problem. The problem was their absence of God as king, really. And God proposes to solve this problem by being king himself. And we see this manifested fully in the person of Jesus Christ. And of course, chapters 34 and 35 uh, kind of go together. And chapter 34 shows the result of what's going to happen if you trust Egypt. Well, it's going to be ugly. There's going to be a lot of devastation and desert. And there's going to be bloodshed all over the place. You're going to be like Edom, basically. And chapter 35 shows a garden, prosperity, and Flourishing. And that's the result of trusting God. And so it's kind of left to, you know, make your choice, guys. You're going to trust God. You're going to trust the nations. And it's amazing what, how history actually plays out. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, history, I mean, Egypt was no help at all. And God destroys the Assyrian army single-handedly. Uh, now, all of this, uh, these chapters also act as kind of a mirror to chapters 40 through 48, which talk about the issue of trusting the idols instead of trusting God, which is really the same fundamental problem. You're trusting in something man-made, something that's human, to solve your issues, and you're not going to have that. It's, and there's definitely, you know, there's a lot of things we could say about today uh, on this issue. Man, man, I mean, you know, the solution to our problems isn't going to come by trying to fix our political issues, you know. I mean, I'm not, not, I'm not trying to deride the, the idea of being involved in things like that. But what I will say is that's not going to fix what's wrong. What's wrong with this country, what's wrong with this world for that matter, is not that the right people aren't voted into office. It's that the right God isn't being worshipped. It's that God is not being recognized for what He is. And that, you know, no amount of you know, election finagling or campaigning or anything else is going to solve that. What's going to solve that is turning to the Lord and trusting in the Lord. And that's the, the solution that Isaiah proposes here. Um, so that, that, that's chapters 28 through 35 in a nutshell. That's the big picture overview. We're obviously not going to be able to cover all of it in the, oh, ten minutes we have remaining. But we'll have that for ne next time. Uh, in chapter 28 and 29, here's the crisis. Isaiah starts out with this criticism of Ephraim. 
which Ephraim is really kind of a stand-in for the whole nation of Israel, the northern section of Israel. Ephraim is often a code word for the northern ten tribes of Israel because Ephraim was the dominant and the most powerful tribe. And large number of the kings of northern Israel actually came from Ephraim. That's kind of an interesting thing to look at historically. And then from verse 14 on to the end of chapter 29, he shifts the focus to Jerusalem's leaders. Now, why do you figure he spent... First of all, why bring up Ephraim and why, after bringing Ephraim up, immediately shift to Jerusalem and talk about them for the rest of the time? What do you think the point is? Then they're not going to be able to read much. Here, well, here's something to think about. Are they even reading any of it right now? Let me ask, you know, are they, do they see any of this? Maybe the point isn't that you know, Isaiah is talking to them. Maybe the point is that Isaiah is talking about what happened to them and saying, now you learn from their mistakes. Yeah. Which, there's a good chunk of the, bite of the prophets that do that. You know, I mean, the whole book of Hosea is, you know, it's addressed to Israel, but throughout are sprinkled these little references to Judah and saying, you know, learn from Israel's mistakes, you know, or the same thing's going to happen to you guys. At the very end of Hosea, there's kind of this editorial comment thrown in that, you know, whoever's wise, learn from this. And the point of the book of Hosea isn't, you know, God's going to crack down on Israel. It seems to me, and this is my suspicion, is that, you know, God has, cracked, has already cracked down on Israel, and you're next, Judah, if you don't change. And so Hosea seems to be addressed in that angle. Jeremiah does the same thing. He says, you know, Israel was a harlot. She went, on ev she went under every green tree. She went on every high hill, and she did all these terrible things. And Judah saw it, and she saw what I did to her, and she didn't learn from it. Um, Ezekiel depicts the same image several times in his book. But, you know, let, let, let's read through this and see how Isaiah turns the tables a little bit. In chapter 28, verses 1 through 13. Woe to the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim, and to the fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is at the head of the fertile valley, of those who are overcome with wine. Behold, the Lord has a strong and mighty agent, as a storm of hail, a tempest of destruction. Like a storm of mighty overflowing waters, he has cast it down to the earth with his hand. The proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim is trodden underfoot, and the fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is at the head of the fertile valley, will be like the first ripe fig prior to summer, which one sees, and as soon as it is in his hand, he swallows it. In that day, the Lord of hosts will become a beautiful crown and a glorious diadem to the remnant of his people, a spirit of justice for him who sits in judgment, a strength to those who repel the onslaught at the gate, and these also reel with wine and stagger from strong drink. The priest and the prophet reel with strong drink. They're confused by wine. They stagger from strong drink. They reel while having visions. They totter when rendering judgment. For all the tables are full of filthy vomit. They're without a single clean place. To whom would he teach knowledge? And to whom would he interpret the message? Those just weaned from milk? Those just taken from the breast? For he says, order on order, order on order. Line on line, line on line. A little here, a little there. Indeed, he will speak to this people through stammering lips and a foreign tongue. He who said to them, Here is rest. Give rest to the weary. And here is repose. But they would not listen. So the word of the Lord to them will be order on order, order on order, line on line, line on line, little here, little there, that they may go and stumble backward and be broken and snared and <laughs> taken captive. And we already talked about why Ephraim is singled out for judgment. The point is to set up Isaiah's real audience. In verse 14 onward is Judah. Uh, and it might even transition before then, but we'll see. Uh, some of this language winds up getting applied to Judah later on. Now, uh, there's, in verses 1 through 8, what are the two things that Isaiah is contrasting? That's one thing. I <laughs> perhaps the uh, verse one he starts out woe to the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim and to the fading flower of its glorious beauty. Okay. And then on down um, in verse five, in that day the Lord of hosts will become a beautiful crown, glorious diadem to the remnant of his people. There it is, the two crowns. You know, you got the crown of Ephraim, the proud crown, and you've got the Lord, who is a beautiful, glorious crown, who replaces uh, a glorious diadem. Um, we might liken that to uh, you go uh, uh, back in Notre Dame. 
You had Victor the, Hugo. Victor mm -hmm. Hugo. Yes, you had the King of France. Then you had the King of Fools. Yeah. In the book. Right. Well, and the Ephraim's crown is a fading flower. It's just temporary. Flowers don't last very long. You know, as Isaiah will later say in chapter 40 and verses 6 through 8, they're, you know, I mean, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it, even though the word of the Lord endures forever. And we see that God sends a mighty flood against Ephraim. That, that's language that we've seen before back in chapter 8 and verses 5 through 8. The Assyrian flood that reached to the neck. Um... Their proud crown, in verse 3, gets trampled and trodden underfoot. Like a ripe fig, they are ripe for the picking, we might say. You pick them off the tree and chomp. Yeah, I'm hungry. That thing is gone. Like that. Um, anyone, and anyone harvesting them for the first time would have wanted to eat them right away. But on the contrast to that, God is a glorious and a beautiful crown. Uh, Isaiah 62 depicts God as a, uh, a crown of sorts. Well, depicts a crown of sorts as well. Actually, I take that back. It's not God that's the crown. It's Israel, or it's the people that become the crown in chapter 62. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not keep quiet until her righteousness goes forth like brightness and her salvation like a torch that is burning. The nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory, and you will be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord will designate. You will also be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. It will no longer be said to you forsaken, nor to your land will it any longer be said desolate, but you will be called my delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and to him your land will be married. So there's this idea, again, of a crown, uh, kind of almost as a wedding gift, you know, Good wife is a crown of beauty for her husband, as the Proverbs say. Um, well, here, God, um, on, on top of that, we also have this comment about the spirit of justice for him who sits in judgment. Similar to in chapter 11, you know, the shoot of David had the spirit of justice upon him. Um, Isaiah has numerous references to the giving of the spirit. Uh, I plan to talk about them later on in the class. I'm not going to do it here. But what we see here is God becomes the true crown. God becomes the true king. Isaiah kind of hints at the solution right here already, even though he doesn't really flesh it out until later. Uh, there's a restoration of the righteous thrones. Uh, the priests and the prophets, however, are affected by drunkenness in verse 7. Uh, they're reeling with strong drink. And contrasting with that, with the, did anybody see something wrong with the fact that priests are, the priests are full of wine and strong drink here? <clears throat> hmm? Where did the wine and the strong drink come from? Well, not just where did it come from, but what else? These are priests, and they have strong drink. Hmm? They, they, they can't render accurate judgment. They, they reel while they're having visions. They totter when rendering judgment. Seven. They just they can't do their job when they're drunk. Okay. All right. Yeah, you're right about that. Um, I guess I'm trying to get people to remember something from Leviticus. But remember what the law said about priests drinking wine or strong drink when they go in to perform the service at the tent of meeting? Oh, they're be executed. They're not to do that. Leviticus 10 verses 8 through 10. And some people suggest that might, that might have contributed to Nadab and Abihu's misconduct there as well. But um, but I mean it's in the same passage anyway. Uh, but drunkenness has already been seen as a picture of sin back in chapter 22 with all that reveling, the let us eat and drink because tomorrow we're going to die. Well, here you've got that going on in Ephraim as well. Uh, the leader should not be given to wine because, well, wine impairs judgment. And, and you know, verse 8 just kind of is just kind of a disgusting picture when you think about it. It's a, you know, there's not one clean place because all the drunks are vomiting everywhere. Oh, that's you know, quite... It's unsanitary, if you will. Um, Pretty vivid. Hmm? Fairly vivid. Yeah, it is. Isaiah, Isaiah doesn't mince words here. Uh, now, verses 9 through 13. Uh, this is kind of an interesting little thing going on here. Uh, verse 9 and 10, Isaiah is being mocked. The people say, oh, who's he teaching knowledge to? Uh, you know, is he teaching knowledge to people just weaned from milk? Which is code for children. You know, is he teaching, you know, is he, why is he talking to us like children? Verse 10, he says, order on order, line on line, little here, little there. Um, I don't know if, uh, does anybody's version have something different there in verse 10? I'm just wondering. Oh, there goes the bell. 
preset. Yeah, that, that's here a little there, a little. basically the same thing. Um, there are some versions out there that just translate it blah, 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 blah. Which is probably closer to what Isaiah's actual point is. Um, you know, <laughs> all he says is blah, 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 blah. That's the point. You know, the, I'll give you the Hebrew translator. It is Sav Latav, Sav Latav, Kav Latav, Kav Latav, Zeir Sham, Zeir Sham. I mean, it sounds like babbling. It's nonsense. It's baby talk, you might say. Why is he talking to us in baby talk? <laughs> the New English says meaningless gibberish, senseless babbling. Meaningless gibberish, senseless babbling. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what it is in Hebrew. It's meaningless gibberish and senseless babbling. And Isaiah's response is, you know, kind of turnaround here in verse 11. He will speak to this people through stammering lips and a foreign tongue. He who said to them, here's rest, give rest to the weary. Here's repose, but they would not listen. Uh, now, that, that statement's quoted in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 14. Paul uses it to talk about speaking in tongues, babbling in another language. But here it says that God's going to speak to the people. You know, God's message to them wasn't baby talk. It was just simple. Here's rest. I will give you rest. That's the teaching of Jesus. I will give you rest. That's what God wanted since the beginning and still desires for His people. But the people refuse to listen to the simplicity. So you know what God says? All right. You want baby talk? I'm going to give it to you. I'll, he throws their babbling back in their face and says, blah, 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 blah. Now, how is He going to communicate to them this time? How is he going to communicate? Let them go and stumble and be broken. Yeah, who's, who's going to be doing the babbling now? Hmm? In Babylon. They're in Babylon. You're, you're on to something, actually. Yeah. <laughs> babbling Babylonian barbarians, right? <laughs> you know, I, I, just, I just wondered if this really should be order on order, line on line. Parallel that to, oh, you're nothing but a pattern theologian. Oh. <laughs> today. Well, Isn't order on order and line on line kind of like similar to having a pattern? You know, oh, he's just a pattern theologian. I, I don't want to get into that right now, but... Uh, you know, I've had brethren that have accused me of being just a pattern theologian. Well, yeah, I am. Then, well, I, I do think we need... And maybe that's kind of what Isaiah is saying here. You know, you, you say, you know, God, you know, Isaiah is just, just saying, okay, I'll accept that. I'll accept what you're charging me with. Uh, I because it doesn't make it false, it's still the truth. Well, that wasn't exactly where I was going with this. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, we're, um, who's going to be doing, well, Seth already kind of hinted at it, you know, who's going to be doing the babbling when their captors come and take them away, they're going to be speaking a language that the people don't know. It's a curse of the covenant. You know, God brings on them a nation that they do not know. They're going to listen to the babbling of foreigners. Jeremiah 5 talks about this. I'm bringing an ancient, night, an ancient nation against you whose language you do not know. Uh, you know, if you won't, listen to the, you won't listen to the gibberish from Isaiah, you're going to listen to the gibberish from the captors telling you what to do. Now, that's not what the people want, but that's the, the idea here. Um, we are past time, so... I'm going to stop here, and uh, we're going to just say uh, that's what we'll pick up next time with uh, verse 14. I apologize. I think, well, you know what? I have the short talk. I'll talk about 1 Corinthians 14 and its usage there. Take advantage of that. <laughs>